Okay. What I'm going to talk about is more in terms of doctoral supervision journey. Now, if you look at this slide, basically it talks about two things here. One, you've got the master and you've got the learner. And when one starts their PhD, what they do is they actually are very much the learner. And again, again, I want you to see this slide carefully because I'll repeat something like this, but from a different standpoint. And what I'm going to be showing you for the next maybe 12 or 15 minutes is a bit about that postgraduate journey. It can be, and I'm going to use examples from a doctoral journey, all right? And again, what I'm going to be using is experiences, my own experience. And apart from it, I'm also going to let you know the positives. Any positive experience is from my own PhD supervisor. Whereas negative, it can be from me or anyone else, and I've done quite a bit of reading for this. Let me just start this talk with a bit of my background. I've done to date about 27 doctoral completions. And these completions have been very much, most of it has been in Australia, and I've also had a completion here in APU. So I must say, it's been a very nice journey. It's been a wonderful journey. So, and if you, what you look there is actually the different topics and the different supervisions that I've had. Now, let me just start with the presentation. Now, if you look at this slide here, what does it tell you? It shows you one doctoral student, and the other side you see actually the supervisor. And if you look at the time the supervisor takes to reply, the actual you know, uh, email that this, the student actually takes about how many minutes here? About you know, 1.3 days to actually conjure that email message, and the supervisor takes 1.3 seconds. And that's how they are with time. All right? But what I want to highlight to you, actually, the area of ambiguity. The student starts with a bit of ambiguity. What's ambiguity? If you can imagine someone who's going through cataract. You know what's cataract? That means you're actually seeing everything very blurred. And that's what it is. And that's how the student is when they start their PhD. And then later, the other part that I want you to look at is in terms of the independent journey. What is that independent journey? They are on the journey themselves. And all they're doing is they're actually walking the journey or running the journey or sleeping the journey. But it's all by themselves, all right? And that's what I want you to understand. Now, let's look at this here. These are some problems from the supervisor's standpoint in terms of students. Let's look at the first one there, lexidesical. This is what the supervisor perceives the student to be. Just laid back, like, you know, they use the word here, lay back, you know, like cool. And again, this is what the supervisor says. Why? Because they're not really moving things. And the other bit is in terms of not admitting problems. Some students can also be very adamant sometimes. You know, they just say, it's black, it's got to be black. You know, black can't be white, there's no gray area. So this is the student side of the equation. And also, in, and, uh, the other part is in terms of poor progress. And students tend to have poor progress. And, that, and I'll talk to you a bit about why this may happen. And may, you know, it may be, a, you know, like I said, always a, a PhD supervision, any form of supervision, it actually takes two hands to clap. So you can't be clapping and you know, having no noise when both of you don't get together. And of course, there's this part on conceptual difficulties. What is conceptual difficulties? This is getting to understand the real background, the theories of what actually your PhD is all about. And I think that can be a problem because students may not be reading as much as they should in terms of the topic area. Now, let me go to the next slide and tell you what actually the students' views. How do students, now I'm trying to put myself as a supervisor in the student's shoes. The main thing is loneliness. Loneliness because all they has, have is themselves and no one else. And then this lonely journey, they're actually trying to find out, why am I doing this? And sometimes they keep slapping themselves. Am I really doing the right thing? Maybe I should do something else. And then the next part there, and you know, in anything, you know, if you look at that top part there, it's they start with the wilderness. They're just going into the wilderness, and they get caught in that loneliness. And, and some of them don't enjoy the topic. And you know why? I don't blame the student. I blame the supervisor. In some cases, some supervisors are so adamant, they actually guide their students to their own topics, so much so they get away from what they want to do. So the student is actually, in a way, short change in terms of supervision. Then there are also practical issues. You know, there are financial issues that they have difficulty with. So what do you do, you know? And again, this is where sometimes I think, as a supervisor, they need to look into the actual student. And again, there's also the aspect of lifestyle. And then sometimes supervisors are difficult to get hold of. You know, they may be, you know, running around and, you know, they may be overseas or whatever. And so that may be a problem. 
The next part is stress and distraction. I think we had a great talk on stress and distraction. And again, if you look at that sign here, this detour, basically that's where you talk about distraction. You can get detoured uh, in terms of, you know, in terms, I mean, I'll give you a good example is a detour is something like where, you know, you accidentally get married or you meet somebody else and then your PhD takes the back seat or your doctorate takes the back seat. And then you have this term called a constipated supervisor. And that does happen. You know why? Some supervisors are so anal. When you give them anything, they want to only find the pedantic mistakes and the small things where the student has put in all the effort. And then again, the supervisor says, no, 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 no. So I think it's like, you know, the supervisors can be a real problem and they get too anal and be constipated. So what students need to do is give them some form of laxative and get them to keep moving their bowels, so to speak. Now, pessimistic. And this is the part of the student. Students tend to be very pessimistic sometimes. You know why? They say, I don't know. I am not sure what's happening. Why? This is where every time we take three steps up, there's one step pulling you down. All right? And that is an issue where students have to get over. Now, here, what do we do? I think the key element in all these things is now I'm slowly getting into the panacea in terms of what we need to do is a relationship. A relationship is a bondage between the supervisor and the student. The first bit of the relationship is basically getting them to be enthusiastic. And enthusiasm has got to be two ways. One has got to be the actual the student being enthusiastic about the topic, and the other, the supervisor, actually encouraging them and also getting them to be enthusiastic, so to speak. And altruism. And this is where I think supervisors need to be altruistic, so to say, in terms of helping the student. Now, if you look at what's written here, my supervisor helped me with my writing, but never pressed me to publish. And I think that's the way it's got to be. Supervisors have to be first thinking of their student and not of themselves, not really looking at the students for a publishing machine. The next bit here is in terms of encouragement. And words of encouragement are very important. You know, and again, every time a student brings something to me, the first thing I tell them, it's great, you've done a fantastic job. But then you may want to change a small thing, rather than the reverse, and I think that needs to happen. And of course, recognize achievement. And I think that's a key element. You know, when any student does anything or anyone, I mean, here I'm talking about a doctoral situation, be it any form of supervision, is actually looking and saying you've done a fantastic job. And look at the positives of that part, not the negatives of it. Of course, pastoral care. This is something I enjoy very much because I think students need this addition other than academic. You know, I've had students who are my own doctoral students back in Australia who actually came and stayed with me because of the fact that they were away from their family. And I think sometimes they need that. They need that additional support. They need that, that feeling of passion that you want to share with them. And they want to know you so you get to know them. And I think that's a key element. That kind of motivates them to go on, hey, there's somebody who cares for me. Now, time. These are the main things that one has got to want, you know, really think about, procrastination. And that is the real thief of time. We always keep saying, oh, we can do it tomorrow. We can do it tomorrow. Why not? Yeah, there's a holiday, public holiday. We've got, you know, this holiday is coming. But that is actually killing and eating us up. And the next bit here is in terms of being, you know, really optimizing your time. Sometimes you need to recapitulate. You need to really look and say, what have I done for this? How do I really actually look at my time and manage it effectively? All right? And the next bit is being realistic and practical. You want to be really practical about your time. You know, for instance, you've got certain commitments. And if I can show you the, la the bottom of the screen, you've got that family bit. Everyone here has got a family. And if you're doing a PhD, don't ignore your family. When they come in here and you don't give them that you know, constipated look, they say, listen, you know, you've got to spend time with your family, and that's important. You've got to give them that time. And I think that's important. The other bit is this, time management. Time management, you've got to be really dynamic and not static. It's not like you just put one concrete time management and it's got to go that way. Now with this millennial age and time that we work with, there are so many things that are happening and we need to really be using our time effectively. Now I've come to this panacea and that's the magic pill. Now what's the magic pill and what are the things in the magic pill? Number one, establish ground rules. With any form of supervision, you need to actually establish the ground rules prior to starting the supervision. Who am I? What am I doing? Why am I doing it? Have that communication with your supervisor. 
And again, this is where we talk about clarify the expectations. You need to really clarify what your time is. What are your time constraints? Are you working and doing your PhD? Are you actually saying, okay, this is what I can do? And I hope, and again, clear the expectations of the supervisor. Are they busy? What are the times? You need to clarify that bit. Oops, sorry. Sorry. Yep, now establish communication channels. And again, when you talk about established communications, now we're talking about working with the millennial wave. We've got all in terms of technology, whether you're going to use email, you're going to go Skype, these kind of things. Honest communication, you don't realize how your supervisor can actually see through you. All right? If you're going to sell, you know, if you're going to basically give a fib, they will know. They can read you like a crystal ball. They can say, yeah, I know. All right? So be very honest about it. Because you know why? You don't want to sour that relationship. You've got a fantastic relationship and enjoy the journey. Then you've got basically encourage the, and also have things by way of dialogue. Now, I've told you these things, and now let me just kind of wrap, tell you a bit of this. Remember, I had the first slide. The first slide, you had the master and the learner. Now they are reversing roles. Your student has actually finished their PhD. They become the expert, and the supervisor becomes a novice. They are learning from that student. So if you can see how the things are flipped around, and this is where there's going to be a lot of respect for each other. And I can tell you this much. I still have a PhD student who's doing very well, and he's an associate professor at a top university. When he sees me, he still addresses me as doctor, although he's already a professor. So that's what I'm trying to say, that expect. Now, all I'm going to do is sum up what I just said over these last 10 minutes. First, you start with a journey going into the wilderness, all right? Next, what happens is this. You say, now I've got to sit down and do some work. You go to the library, you do all this work, and then you have this organized mess on your desktop. All right? Then some of you have these screens, and I know you're going to find files. Prior to desktop, you'll have an organized mess in your own room. Then you get excited. Oh, I've got this conceptual model. I'm so thrilled. It's the best thing since slice of bread. All right? After that, what happens? You get a detour. Detour, oh gee, you know, I've got so much of work, you know, the sun is coming down on me, it's raining, nothing to do with you, it's all external, you know. Everybody outside is bothering you except yourself, all right? And that's what happened. Then finally you realize, how long can I be on this detour? I've got to do something about it. You sit down, you keep, you know, punching away, and then you get excited now, okay, I'm reaching, I can see the light, the tunnel is getting a bit brighter now. Then you get this particular... Final analysis, oh, you're about to throw this party. Before, just as you're throwing the party, you get this graduation. Hallelujah. You know, you feel really great. Okay? And then finally, you go on a cruise. All right? Now, I'll tell you something. All what I went through and what I learned and all the positives I've learned would never have happened if this gentleman was there, not there in my life. And he was my supervisor when I did my PhD. He took me through the journey, and I'm here today because of him. All right? And don't thank me, just thank him. Thank you very much for listening.